Jason, I'm glad you brought up our conversation when, with the introduction, because when I met with, with him, um, one of the things we really started to talk about was less the work that we do and actually how we work. And because of the sort of diversity of the crowd here, what we thought we'd do is present um, five projects but present them sort of through the lens of work collaborative, sort of work organization, and not necessarily the products that, that we're producing or the projects that we're doing. So we'll be able to delve in a little bit to what it is that we're actually making, but we're, we're sort of foregrounding the way that we organize teams and the way that we set up work, work units to get things done. Um, the name of the practice is Human Practice. Uh, part of the reason for that is that when we started out, I was in Houston, Texas, and was living there for about 20 years before I moved here. Hence, boots. Um, and Mark was in Minneapolis. And one of the things that, that we realized is that we were spatially separate, um, but our work project product sort of benefited from that distance, that we were able to engage um, some of the tools that were, at the time, coming along. We've been together for like 12, years or so. So we were at the very beginning of social networking and things like that, and a lot of our work was done through like Yahoo groups and some things that are completely antiquated at the moment. But we realized that the sort of differences between the two kind of identities and the communities that we were in and the way that um, the two communities thought about work, space, natural resources, all sorts of things uh, become really, became really critical to how we began to, to do things. So when we think about ourselves as human, um, we think about both the locations that we came from and now the fact that I'm in, in Vancouver adds a dimension to that. And we also um, like the name quite a bit because it was a homophone for the type of social collaborative that we wanted to work through. We didn't want to be sort of a, an office with a, door, a front door and the two of us are sort of the figureheads of the office and that was, that was as far as it went. Um, we really try to pull in as diverse a group of people as we can to address our projects. So what we did is we started to set up a graph. We got curious about how our teams are organized. So you see at the top sort of a list of, of a bunch of the collaborators that we've worked with and set of projects at the bottom. And so really each of the projects takes on a spatial almost constellation of team. And so depending on the scale of the projects and the specifics of the projects, you begin to see different groups begin to organize. Certain people kind of duck in and out more frequently. Some people we work with once, and then they go on their way, and we go on our way. And then some of the people, like in this case, Susanna is added to our group. The blue is human in the middle. Uh, the rest of those groups are various people. Yellow, I think, are, are student collaborators, orange are professionals, or fabricators, people like that. Um, we begin to set up a broader group of individuals um, that stay with us. And then through them, we begin to network even further. So I think over the course of two dozen projects or so, we've worked with 200 different people. And the way we structure contracts, the way we structure hierarchy within the team, it's very much a field condition. It's not at all top down. We're more than happy to work with people who are way smarter than we are because it makes us look better and look smarter ourselves. We're also happy to take point and lead through jobs too. So that's Mark and me. I, if I could um, yeah, just add something, it? yeah, I think um, you know both of us are um, in in academics, and um, one of the advantages to being in big universities like we both are is we have access to really really interesting uh, people who want to collaborate and want to work on projects that reside somewhere between the silos of the two disciplines. And so we've worked with people like biologists on certain projects. We've worked with computer scientists. We've worked with all kinds of different myriad of, of different engineers. And um, we, we really use the fact that we're in these academic settings to our, our advantage to sort of push our work in directions that it wouldn't ordinarily be pushed if it was just the two of us working on. And I think a, a sort of counterpoint to that is those folks in the professional arena that we've been able to collaborate with have seen a, a big advantage in working with us because of the access that we have to the sort of research equipment and things like, you know, mm -hmm. things of that nature that help us push the work from more of a prototyping and a research point of view. So it really expands the reach of the professional discipline just as much as it, it allows us to, to work on a bunch of different compelling projects. So. Um, Let's see if I can get my flow back. 
<laughs> so instead of presenting ourselves as the two of us that are sitting up here, or maybe as an extended group, if you add Susanna and Dave, who we collaborate with quite a bit, um, we really see our office as this sort of growing field of individuals, and that ultimately the whole system gets blurred, and the project can, can be a shifting zone of individuals that address work. And you're probably out there thinking, okay, so what? Great. You guys are collaborators, you get it. Um, what does that net you? Well, one of, the, one of the things that nets us is the ability to do a variety of projects and to address those projects from the point of view of how we're working and not necessarily what we're working on. Um, so a lot of you will probably recognize a timeline like this. This is basically a workflow sequence that we've all learned, we've been taught, it's been handed down from on high on the mountain hundreds of years ago, I'm sure where we, we have a linear process where we start with planning, we go through schematic design development, construction documentation, bid negotiation, and, and construction document administration. Uh, that's how we get work done. Um, when we look at this type of timeline, we begin to think about how can we expand the reach of the architect by, if we talk about it in say, petroleum industry terms, by pushing upstream or downstream and where we actually engage the client or we engage the process. Um, can we begin to hack certain aspects of the job? Can we begin to modify things? Can we act as a bridge for other more conventional practices? Um, as we push into social media, can we use a, a swarm strategy to do smarter work? Um, or can we use networking to expand the reach of the type of project that we do? So as we go through, we're going to break down projects according to you know, each of these works and delve in deeper. So what does that allow us to do? We do traditional work. Um, we work on parks, we work on houses, we work on, on various um, competitions, interiors, things like that. But we've also pushed into the virtual world a little bit. We've set up a, uh, basically a market platform called Hometa, Hometa.com, which is my, my plug, um, which is a modern home plan company that works a little bit like a Sears Roebuck house plan company. We'll delve into that a little bit more deeply uh, coming up here. We also do a lot of prototyping, where we begin to go into the shop and actually reconsider conventional practices and begin to apply techniques that we bring in from the automotive industry, from the aerospace industry, from material researchers, people like that, and see if we can develop smarter and more responsive systems. The way that we build, if you look at this wall, even over here, it's really dead tech. It's exactly the way we've built walls for generations, and other disciplines Everything from the textile industry to the automotive industry are far more advanced than we are. We think that there's a lot of potential to learn from those industries. We, um, um, we sort of uh, think about a lot of the prototypes. In fact, Blair mentioned the automotive industry. We think about them um, as analogous to concept cars in the, in the automotive industry. So we use them as platforms to test out new materials, to test out new fabrication strategies. And um, a lot of times, the the firms with whom we work on projects um, come to us because they want to incorporate some innovation that we've developed in one of these projects into, um, into a commercial project. And uh, they want to figure out how they can, how they can take it and, and sort of streamline it and, and fold it into a kind of more normative practice condition. So the, the prototypes have really been um, a way for us to sort of um, Work with, work with people who we wouldn't ordinarily have been able to work with. And sort of extend their reach, mm -hmm. which I think is, is important to us. Um, we're also able to take on a, a, a broader array of projects. For example, a speculative project that deals with packaging for coffee, or um, a prototype that one of our colleagues was developing for a, an electric vehicle and helping him work through how the, the car actually interfaces with individuals and also with fueling stations. Um, and then also we found that it gives us a chance to push the office into arenas that we feel like the architectural discipline is lost. For example, if you look at mass-produced housing, it's really a product. It's not the arena of the architect anymore. But if we can start to think about um, the delivery of the house productively and begin to actually push on and work on how the house is organized, how it's produced, where the actual decisions that generate the house happen, whether it's in the bank or it's in some sort of uh, timber factory, whatever that is, um, you begin to operate in that arena as well. So now what we're going to do is, is actually focus on five different projects, and we're going to start with the idea of swarming.
want to drive? Or you want me to go? Sure. Um, so this uh, first project um, is uh, called Oswall, and Oswall stands for Open Source Wall. Um, and the idea behind this project is that we actually leverage the intelligence of a larger crowd, um, a swarm of people, to influence the design of the wall. It's not just us designing the wall, but what we're doing is setting up a uh, platform um, that allows people to sort of plug their own ideas into that wall. So this project, um, like many of our projects, grew out of uh, a, a seed of ideas that happened in earlier work. And these are um, some house prototypes that we've designed, as well as some wall prototypes that have led um, progressively to this latest um, permutation. Um, so Oswald is uh, made up of two primary elements. One element is the frame, and the other element is the skin, just like most walls. The frame uh, is designed um, and, and influenced by uh, a, an animal called a barn swallow. And anyone who's familiar with a barn swallow knows that um, their nests are really interesting. Their nests are actually um, uh, have embedded with, with them a, a cross section of all the materials that they find locally in, in any one area. And then, but then the nest also has a universal um, component to it, which is um, mud and saliva. So the pleasant. The, uh, the so the barn swallow uh, makes its nest out of mud and saliva, and that's the universal element. And the sticks and the twigs that it finds locally in, in say, a rural setting, or the trash and the garbage, or you know, pieces of newspaper that it finds in an urban setting. Um, uh, form form the other part of the nest. So this idea that that the nest is made up of both universal and locally procured elements is what drove the design of the frame of the wall. So um, the frame, uh, as you can see here in this early sketch, is made up of these uh, brackets as well as stick elements. And the brackets are the universal pieces that accommodate a whole host of different types of stick elements. Um, and then the skin is where we're leveraging um, the intelligence of a wide array of people to customize the house in order to accommodate uh, different, different types of users and different types of uh, uh, settings and climates. So here you, uh, here you see the, uh, the brackets, which are, the, again, the universal element of the, of the frame wall. And um, these, but these brackets are designed so that they can accommodate a whole host of different framing elements. So in North America, you um, might have this kind of standardized lumber that um, is connected by these framing elements. But in Southeast Asia, you might connect pieces of bamboo together. Or in another region, you might uh, connect pieces of, um, of uh, uh, metal scaffolding uh, cross-section. So the idea is uh, that you could ship a box of these brackets to a remote location and then use locally procured sticks to build the frame of a house. Or even sticks that are pulled out of a demo site, for right. example. So one of the things we became sort of compelled with with the notion of this idea is that uh, it's a different way to think about not only the performance and the organization of the house, but it's also an interesting way to start to think about sustainability. Because if you can begin to provide a system where you don't necessarily have to ship every component of the house throughout the planet. You can ship something flat to a location or actually just send a cut file to a location and have them cut out a component. Maybe we prototype an actual tool that you use in the field to actually form up a house. One of the things we were interested in is this is a, a strategy for disaster relief and things like that. Um, you can cut out a, a large amount of of the fuel expenditure and the embedded energy that typically is in a house, where if all the timber is coming from one location, it's going to be throughout the system. So a flexible system, a consistent strategy for construction, does more than just create a compelling space frame. It actually impacts the way that the house is shipped. So here you see some of those uh, framing elements holding together um, this wall. The wall actually. Um, is much stronger than a conventional stick frame wall, and it uses far less wood um, to be constructed. So it's, uh, it's, it's both stronger and more efficient than a typical wall. Right. The initial prototype we used two by fours, and it was way overbuilt. And so we were able to, to drop down into one by twos, 
which is also interesting because the, the lumber industry views that as basically waste wood, right? And so we're able to take on things that typically are throwaway and use those as the primary building component. And then the skin, as I mentioned, um, is built around the idea of kind of an, an open source design development pattern. So um, you have things like um, the, the, the iPhone or the Android um, marketplace where people can make little programs and you can download those programs that you want onto your phone and that sort of customizes your phone. So your phone is, is your phone and it, it, it does the things that you want it to do. So we thought, what if a house, if a house could do the same thing? What if uh, people could design um, apps, which are the panels that skin the wall, and, um, and you could go down to a marketplace and pick out the panels that you want that, um, that uh, allow the, custom to, the house to behave and to operate the way you specifically want it to operate. It's not um, a universal one-size-fits-all system. And your product isn't dictated so far upstream by a bank and a factory system that's generating the product. Right. Um, so some of the other things we looked at as precedent were the Nike ID system where you can go online and sort of customize um, shoes and they'll fabricate them and send them to you. Um, it's a similar sort of idea, but at the scale of architecture. So we speculated on some of the applications that one could um, imagine being developed for this type of system um, from uh, applications that uh, harvest wind and generate electricity to um, wall panels that can uh, grow plants uh, to others that might um, harvest rainwater, um, others that might recycle uh, gray water and use water and so forth. And then um, those apps can be compiled in different configurations, which give you a sort of uh, a wall that is a tapestry of different um, performance, uh, performance considerations. So by standardizing the frame, um, one of the examples that we became kind of interested in is, is the way that Chuck Close works. Um, I think most of you know who Chuck Close is. He's an artist who um, is quadriplegic. He got injured, I think, in an accident, right? That, that left him paralyzed. And so he, he developed a system by which he could actually continue to do his work. And so the strategy was to create a, a standardized grid. And then within that grid, he would make a series of controlled marks and it's the distribution and the arrangement of those marks that you actually, as you zoom out, you end up with an image that's rendered. And so when we, we began to think about the performance of the wall, we began to speculate on what if, for example, the house and the performance of the house could be an issue, issue of resolution and not one of a one-size-fits-all solution. So if you lived on the sun, if you had a sunny side of your house, you could have a higher percentage of solar panels, things like that. If you're in a windy area, you could have part of your house respond to a local condition. And your house could be rendered in a completely different way than maybe your neighbor's house. Or your walls would be different or maybe switch. And so, they could also be switched out over a shorter time period. So we actually ran a competition for um, people to design applications for the wall. And um, these are some of the results of that competition. Uh, we were building a prototype of the wall for an exhibition uh, at the Pratt Manhattan, Manhattan Gallery in New York, and uh, and uh, we picked several um, winners um, whose apps we fabricated for that exhibition. This is one of the winners. It was a uh, interior um, storage application. So these wall panels sort of pull out and you can store things actually in the thickness of your wall um, and make them go out, uh, kind of hide out of sight. And then the the surface of the wall is, a, is, a, uh, is uh, an absorptive kind of acoustic surface made out of uh, industrial felt. Um, so we also developed our own applications for the wall, which we uh, used to build a full-scale prototype. And the outside skin was developed by looking at several different precedents. One precedent was uh, in the lower left-hand corner here, the desert rhubarb which um, is a uh, champion in biology of uh, collecting and, uh, um, and, and channeling rainwater. Um, so the grooves on the outside skin of the wall are, um, are designed based on a close examination of, of, of that particular biology and how it moves water to its roots in a very arid climate. Um, the other precedent was actually from industrial design. It was this uh, concept car by Hyundai called the Blue Will. And it is, uses uh, a fold in the skin of its sheet metal 
to increase the strength of the of the car. And th what that allows them to do is actually make the, the metal much thinner um, and thereby lighter and more fuel efficient. So you're using shape to increase strength of material. And so both of those uh, precedents, are, along with uh, this um, throat of the, of the blue whale, um, which is informed a way for, for us to store water, all kind of inform the exterior skin of the wall. And you can see a mock-up of that here. And then the, the interior or internal skin was driven by a, a similar set of um, precedents, um, one of them being a, uh, a pretty amazing biology called the Suriname toad, um, which actually stores its young in its back um, and uh, gives, gives, gives uh, birth to its young out of these pores in its back. It's really pretty alarming and, and pretty gross if you can. You can YouTube it. If you want to YouTube it. You don't want to check it out when you YouTube it. It's, it's kind of horrible. But the idea that's interesting about it is that a surface could have the capacity to both protect the animal on the outside, to regulate its relationship to the environment, but also temporarily serve the purpose of, of storing, or in this case, actually being a nursery for its young. That sort of dual capacity became a, a pretty compelling idea. So then, in terms of the future development of the wall surface, um, we're looking at different high-tech fabrics um, and thinking about ways in which that frame can be constructed. And then simply um, a, a skin can be pulled over the top of it, and that skin could have all kinds of intelligence pre-manufactured into it. Um, things like uh, woven um, um, bioluminescent lighting, um, uh, fabrics that, um, that, could, that could heat and cool the interior, uh, fabrics that could um, let air in, but also uh, keep rain out, and so forth. It becomes more like a high-tech jacket. This is a shot of the interior. Um, the fabrication of this project actually has led to some other research that we're going to show in a minute. Um, but the, the exterior panels were um, vacuum formed. And that led us to sort of question the whole process of vacuum forming and instigated a whole um, trajectory of research that we're now uh, undertaking. You can see here the, uh, the frame, which goes up really quickly. And then uh, the skin being applied um, to the frame. Uh, the full-scale prototype uh, in the gallery. Um, and then we speculated on what this might mean for a uh, full-scale um, house. Kind of less compelling as a pavilion, but more interesting when you start to, to think about, again, the issues of resolution, and that you could have any number of components um, that organize that outside skin, and then in the next slide, um, the other part that we became really interested in is that we also have a wide array of authors represented there. So the idea of sole authorship and that, that sort of model of the architect and then all the minions that work beneath the architect, we actually are, are challenging with the idea of crowdsourcing a house and giving over our authorship to a broader group. We think that there's a lot of potential in that. So, so the other way that um, or the next way that we sort of inserted ourselves in an unconventional way into a more conventional kind of construction process is um, through modding. And what we mean by um, modding is uh, taking a kind of existing um, fabrication technology and figuring out ways that we can modify that fabrication technology and, and um, sort of purposely misuse the technology to do something that it can't currently do. It's sort of amplifying your augmented. Right. So it's it's sort of taking um, taking our expertise and and inserting it um, earlier into the design process, not not after the fabrication tools have been made and figuring out how we can use those, but actually going back and questioning the fabrication tools and figuring out what are some new ways that we can use those. So I mentioned vacuum forming. It's a it's a technology that's been around for a long time. And it's something that we've used on several of our projects. And every time we use it, we get increasingly sort of frustrated with the limitations of it. So um, with this project, um, which is called uh, Hexwall, we um, question the way that vacuum forming works. So the way vacuum forming works now is you make a mold, and then you, um, you, suck pla you heat plastic, and you suck that plastic down over the mold, and it gives you one shape. Um, if you want another shape, you have to make a new mold and suck the plastic down over that new mold to make a new shape. 
So it's really inefficient if you want variation in the final product. It's super efficient if you want repetition, but if you want variation, it's not very efficient. So we looked at some historic precedents. Um, this is actually Corbusier's uh, Brussels, uh, uh, Phillips Pavilion in Brussels, um, where he had a, 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 um, a pavilion that had a series of differently shaped uh, concrete panels. And uh, he built basically a giant sandbox and used sand to create molds that could uh, form these different shaped concrete panels. So the sand can be torn down, reconfigured, and then a new mold can be poured. Um, some contemporary precedents that we looked at are um, these little toys that you've all seen where you can press your hand or your face into it and it gives you an imprint of, uh, of, of what was pressed into it. Hand for mark, face for me. <laughs> That's right. Um, as well as uh, Tara Donovan, who's an artist who um, builds these beautiful kind of uh, sculptures out of found materials um, to create topographic surfaces. And then um, in the sailing industry, they've created this uh, dynamic um, forming table that um, can change its shape so that different shaped sails can be molded on the same table. And that really became the primary kind of uh, precedent for um, the hex wall project. Um, the site for the project is really very modest. It's a bathroom. And uh, we, the, the client, um, for this project, asked if we could just renovate, you know, design a, renovate, a renovation for their bathroom, and we said we'd do it for free if they would let us have our way with one of the walls in the in the room. Um, and uh, so they agreed to it, and um, so this became the site for this kind of experimental um, wall surface. So we began to to do a project. We, we looked at the wall. We began to track and spatialize a lot of the programmatic needs for the wall, everything from where you get toilet paper to where you put your feet, to where light comes from from the window, really sexy, interesting things. Um, and I can flip to the next slide. And we began to speculate, one, on how we could begin to organize those things on the wall, and then two, how we could begin to produce it. So we looked at the wall, we spatialized it, and we began to come up with a, with a topography. Basically, there's there's a surface that begins to be manipulated um, according to programmatic need and programmatic response. So there's a, the, the wall sort of flattens out where um, a, a door folds into it. It also kind of cups in where there's an adjacent window and we want light to be reflected into the space. And then it billows out in other areas where we're going to backlight it and uh, have it, illumin have it uh, create luminescence within the space. So we're thinking about the wall as a surface that basically can be programmed. And it, it builds in a degree of sophistication that directly challenges what the vacuum forming technology is allowing us to do. Right, so once we form the topography, we broke the wall down into um, a kind of a manageable grid size, which is a, uh, a what's 12 inch, 12 inch by 12 inch. <laughs> He's trying to convert to that. I, I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> um, wall panel. And, uh, the thing that's interesting about these, these panels is that each one of them is different. So um, how if you were to do this with conventional vacuum forming, this would be many, many thousands of dollars because each of the molds would cost uh, probably a thousand or two thousand dollars to make. So we were working on kind of a shoestring budget and wondering how we could develop a wall that's made out of individually differential panels <clears throat> within a very inexpensive budget. And because of our position, and some of the things we don't have to deal with, we're able to look at those types of, of business pressures and market pressures as an impetus to actually do something unconventional as opposed to retreating from an idea and right. actually reset it. So we had the opportunity to make a new vacuum former. Um, we we uh, pulled together a system um, of pistons that um, move up and down on a on a computer um, driven table. And uh, those pistons create the surface of the, of the topography um, on a panel by panel basis. So you make one panel and then uh, a computer adjusts, a, a computer program adjusts the position of the, pan, of the pistons and then you make another panel and so on and so forth. Um, this is just some, some schematics of the vacuum forming machine. Um, we prototyped and tested the idea first to see if it would even work. Um, this is the 
the vacuum forming machine, like I said, it's been around forever. This machine was built in the 50s, and so we actually um, took apart this machine and, um, and re rebuilt the machine to make it do what we wanted it to do. Um, these are some um, early kind of uh, versions of the panels. This is what the wall looks like close up. You can see these are some renderings of how the, how the, the wall is configured within the space. And we got really interested in what this would be like when it was backlit as well. One of the, one of the things that happens is the material actually gets thinner depending on the depth of the draw, which means that not only are you rendering a formal surface, you're also playing with the degree right. of transparency and translucency. So the light actually has a enhancing effect. Uh, enhancing yeah. effect and sort of corresponding um, response to the actual tool and the material of uh, organization. So here you can see the tool and the pistons, how they uh, move up and down and are adjusted by a series of threaded rods. So it feeds into the computer that's just driving it. Right. And these are some of the really early kind of failed attempts at making this work. It took us several dozen attempts, which is part of the prototyping process. Anyone that's ever done a prototype knows that it involves a lot of trial and error, a lot of failed attempts. And we sort of embrace those, those failures as learning opportunities and ways to develop and, and, and enhance the process that we're working in. Um, failure, we view as something that's good, not, not bad. So these are um, the final panels. Uh, this is two rows of them um, that we initially made to test um, how they would be backlit. We did a series of uh, studies that investigated um, how much light would come through the panels. And then um, these are those panels um, Ready to be shipped. shipped. Uh, the project's going to be installed uh, later in October. Um, but we're really excited about how well um, the panels uh, turned out. And each one of those panels, again, is like is is different from the next. Completely um, uh, differentiated from from each each of their neighbors through very inexpensive um, means. So that project uh, led us um, to get even more interested in vacuum forming and how we can um, leverage ideas of, of uh, unpredictability and failure in the uh, vacuum forming process and even further kind of hack the, um, the technology. So and, one, sort of yeah, quick, one, one thing we'd like to distinguish between is when we think about modding something, we're basically accepting the conventional approach and looking right. at ways to enhance it or amplify it or somehow positively impact it. Um, when we think about hacking as an approach to our work, we're actually saying we don't buy into this system, but we're trying to subvert something about the process in hand. So it's it's sort of a subtle distinction, but mm -hmm. I think it's an important one, and it's clearly our co-opting a term. But mm -hmm. when we say those two words next to each other, that's what we mean. So yeah. So again, we got interested in how we could um, uh, do vacuum forming in a way that is not it's not conventionally done, and in this case. Um, we were thinking about how you could draw air through an open box over a series of cables or wires or other materials and, um, and, and uh, create a situation in which we can't predict the end product. We got really interested in this idea that we would set up a framework under which these panels would be produced, but that the final um, shape of the panels is something we, we wouldn't know how it would turn out until we actually did it. And so we set up a series of uh, speculations on, on um, different ways that we could engage vacuum forming. Some of them involve um, uh, open boxes with uh, various kind of rods sticking in the side, um, using air pushing against the vacuum forming, so using both positive and negative air pressure to create different types of uh, effects, um, using cables, um, different types of polymers and so forth. And we've set up a kind of a, a matrix of, we, it's a kind of a roadmap of our, of how we're going to experiment with these, uh, with these materials. Um, so these are just quick diagrams of, of how we're going to go about um, exploring the vacuum forming. Again, using cables, air-filled bladders, uh, different densities of foams um, that might collapse under the pressure of uh, the vacuum forming machine and uh, so forth. The initial experiment we set up was to uh, pull cables tight across the, an open box and then um, pull air uh, 
through those cables and allow the plastic to slump across the cables and then sort of slump in between the cables so that we're creating a shape without using a mold. And it's something that, it's working in a way that vac uh, vacuum formers never work this way. They never, they never work with unpredictability. They always want to predict how the, exactly the panel's going to look. And in this case, you can see there's a lot of variation that happens. And um, we find that variation and unpredictability to be really interesting. We also like the notion that it begins to insert sort of a, a sense of craft back into digital making. And I think one of the things that people bemoan when they think about laser cutters and they think about vacuum formers and things like that is they think that we've lost a sense of craft in making. And here, one of the things that we're really cognitive of is the fact that the material itself is very present and an active participant in the production of something. And that it's, it's what that material is able to do and letting it actually tell us what it's able to do that becomes the, the point of craft. So for us, it's no different than working wood. We're just allowing those things to play out in a specific way and allowing the material to communicate back to us. Yeah, and along those lines, um, what we're interested in now is um, making uh, these, these uh, molded panels um, with these unconventional methods and then pairing them with other kinds of materials to do things that um, would otherwise be really costly to do. So in this case, we're speculating on how we could use these vacuum form panels as a mold to then um, um, cast um, uh, pressed industrial felt and use that felt as an acoustic surface. Um, and again, making that pressed felt in a convention, through a conventional method would require many, many different shapes of molds um, and would be fairly costly. But just by simply adjusting the position of these wires, we can have an infinite number of shapes and final mold, mold configurations, which can give us different types of uh, acoustic panels um, through a method that's very inexpensive. And potentially expressive, which is interesting to think about when we think about digital fabrication, is that there's a form of expression that's sort of latent in that process. Right. So these are just this this research is very um, very early and current in its development. It's this is sort of hot off the presses, and it's not um, refined. Not refined yet, but we thought we'd share it with you because we're we're excited about the direction of it, and it's producing some really um, compelling early early results. Now that sort of shift scales entirely. Absolutely. So this this is the Hometa project. Let's take a look at that. Um, which is an example of thinking in a completely different way. Again, using a, a, a newer technology, but trying to be productive with that. And so Hometa, like I said, is a, a home house plan company um, that sells modern plans. And the idea behind the company, a group of us set this up when we were based in Houston. Um, at the time, we began recruiting architects of some renown and then architects that we thought were quality, quality folks to develop a, a house plan. And the idea behind the company is that by shifting the relationship of the architect to the consumer, we might be able to not subvert the market sort of share and location of the architect, but expand it. Um, and so we asked some some architects, people like Wes Jones, and Garofalo, and uh, Luis Tumaki Lewis, and have some, some fairly solid names in our roster, to provide the plans for a house they've done or something that they're speculating on. We, we asked them to be a small house. We asked them to have a degree of sustainable capacity and that it, it be um, something that they wanted to put forward. And we asked them to provide a builder set. And we took on the responsibility of liability, we took on the responsibility of distribution, and we began to build um, a virtual locus for this design community that we were setting up. So at homeeta.com, you're able to go through and actually look at the house plans. We have architects from South America, from Asia, from North America, from Europe, a, a broad group of people. Um, you're able to go in and actually do a degree of shopping online. Um, you browse images or read narratives that the, the uh, authors of the projects put forward. We also had a crazy idea that we could set up house tours, but we could do it using a sim platform. So we went through and we actually made it so that you could build an avatar, that's virtual me, I want to be a construction worker in this case. Um, and you can walk through houses, open doors, close doors, actually build around inside a virtual house just like you would if you were on a regular house tour. And we began to expand that notion and actually place smaller design objects within the houses. 
and set up the condition so every time you saw a question mark, you hit it, it launches a sub web page, which takes you to a product page, which allows you to actually buy the cut files for a bookshelf, for example, take the cut files to a local fabricator. And so for 20 bucks, you can negotiate with somebody locally and have that product fabricated as opposed to having the added burden of paying for my overhead of keeping stock, my overhead of producing these things speculatively. Um, it basically cuts out that middle part of the project that makes things more expensive and in concept expands the reach of what a designer can do and how they can offer their work. So we're really trying to think about how a network can begin to set up a condition where you buy house plant construction plans. We give contractors locally um, first right at dealing with new customers. Um, and basically, our hope is that it drops the bar for people who want to get into the market for a custom home. Um, so that it's not just the very sort of elite yeah. set of individuals who can, who can address these things. And then part of our role was to create the buzz, the hype, the environment that goes along with it. So setting up YouTube interviews with, with different architects. This is David Clover's which is located in Hong Kong, that you see on the screen there. We set up a series of shows to announce what we're doing. We were invited to do some TEDx talks, which was really exciting for us to get to do. Um, we did like goofy things, and one of the things we got the most run for is we, we developed a series of gingerbread houses and put those online, and those things went viral. We got more press from the gingerbread house than we did out of any sort of kind of, we're gonna help the world and give you design, and they're like, we need gumdrops, right? And so, <laughs> That was a big lesson for us too, is that by basically allowing ourselves to have a little bit of fun with something and, and communicate with a group in a way that was a little more maybe mainstream, we were able to actually get the message out in a way that we normally wouldn't have. And all of these things, um, these techniques began to come together in, in sort of a new speculative business, business model that we have for ourselves. Um, the way that we termed it is bridging, where we begin to position ourselves as a marketing arm, as a research arm primarily for more conventional practices that are interested in this type of work, but don't necessarily want to invest the time or energy or maybe aren't able to invest the time and energy in setting up the type of infrastructure that's necessary for generating this type of mm -hmm. work. Yeah, it's a way for um, firms that have sort of um, financial bottom lines to meet and, and um, limited resources to sort of outsource innovation and outsourced research in, in areas that in which we have expertise. And so we've been working with some really exciting and interesting um, firms. Um, and this project is, is representative of, of one of the most exciting projects we've been involved with in, in a while. And um, this was a, a collaborative um, a comp a competition entry that um, we submitted with uh, VJAA Architects in Minneapolis, which is Vince James and Jennifer Yost. Um, they just won the, the, in the United States, the AIA uh, National Firm of the Year Award. Um, so we were kind of humbled and we yeah, were really humbled had, to be able to work with them. Uh, along with Diane Willow, who is a, uh, a really well-known um, artist uh, in the Twin Cities and a uh, local engineering firm called VAA Engineers. And uh, the project was to um, redesign a public plaza, a very prominent public plaza, on the University of Minnesota's campus, which is uh, located um, between the Frank Gehry designed uh, Wiseman Art Museum and the KPF designed um, uh, Student Services Building um, on the other side. And, this plaza is so busy, it has about 20,000 students that, that walk through it on, on any given day. It's the upper deck of a bridge that actually crosses a pretty deep cut that the Mississippi River makes. Um, so it's a, it's a compelling site because it's very visually prominent. It's a, it's a point from which you can see and view the entire city. It also has one of the most extreme ranges of sort of weather, temperature, exposure that you can imagine because you're walking across a bridge in Minneapolis. So in the wintertime, that's a fairly extreme environment. In the summertime, that's a relatively extreme yeah. environment, right? And so, so as we're looking at this plaza, we're not only thinking about opportunities to sort of make it really um, successful as a program, we're also thinking about all of these other conditions where it has to perform 
one might say sustainably, one might say from an environmental perspective, but basically we just look at performance as, as the underlying theme. So we were really influenced um, by this idea of flow, and we thought about flow um, with regards to the river underneath, um, and actually there's a five layers of flow that occur within a cross section of the site. There's the Mississippi River down below, there's light rail, bus, and car traffic on, a, on the bridge um, below the deck. Um, there's uh, uh, the flow of, um, of, of bicyclists and pedestrians um, up on the deck. Um, there's also the, the flow of air that moves really um, quickly across the, across the surface of, of the deck. And so there are all kinds of um, interesting flows that need to be managed and accommodated um, within that space that aren't accommodated well at all within the, within the existing plaza. The river is also a major flyway, so we're, we became really interested in the, in the way that birds actually move through yeah. that side because they, they situate themselves sexually both under, through, and above the bridges. So this is an existing plan of, um, of the, uh, the plaza along with a covered walkway that spans across the top of the deck. And um, our first move was to chop that uh, walkway back uh, four bays to give ourselves more room and to make the plaza much more of a kind of a destination place and a pausing point as, as opposed to just a, a thoroughfare. Um, we thought about uh, the kind of the lateral flow down the length of the bridge, which is the primary direction of the flow and sort of splitting that and allowing there to be a, uh, an eddy, to use a, a river metaphor, um, a sort of swirl at the lead edge of this covered walkway that would allow for students to hang out, to study, to people watch, and also for events to occur, for, for movies and things like that. Um, we peeled the surface up to create a, an elevated platform. Um, we. Uh, Allowed, allowed for the flow to move around um, this, upper, this upper deck and to lead into areas like the art museum and the student center that are adjacent to it. Then we created a, uh, a um, media screen. Yeah, like a big media screen um, that at the, at, the tap, at the lead edge of, of that platform. And that, um, that media screen, which could be located at a number of positions, um, serves to not only um, show media, but also as a kind of structural support for a new canopy that extends out over the space. Um, we added a cafe, um, focused a lot on the, the ground surface and, and, and how that's uh, rendered. And then uh, one of the things we spent a lot of time on with, uh, with our team was on this uh, trellis work that forms a new kind of overhead canopy um, above the above the, the plaza. Um, one of the reasons we were brought into the project was to begin to consider um, innovative and um, unconventional materials that could be deployed across the, the multiple surfaces of the project. And so we looked at things like piezoelectronics, which are surfaces that you can walk across and they generate electricity. We looked at luminescent paints that can be applied to the surface, um, LED strips that can be embedded within the surface and can pr provide direction and orientation in terms of flow. Um, this is a night, kind of a night shot. And, uh, and, and we, we really worked on um, the, the idea that the underside of, of this new uh, canopy could be programmed in a multitude of different ways. This is uh, what it might look like in the winter. Uh, one, of, one of the things that became really important to the team is you have two very iconic buildings, and uh, sometimes one of the things that's most difficult for a designer to do is to be quiet. Um, we felt like there was enough noise on the site, and so one of our objectives with the roof, and again, as Mark said, we were brought in to really speculate on the structural system that we would deploy for that roof. Um, and I think part of the reason that we won the competition for the project is that we, we tried to skinny up the move that we made and make, make it as thin and as unobtrusive and elegant as we possibly could, and let the crux of the project be the way that it began to connect different groups and began to deploy materials in a way 
that would support or amplify an event and effect. So, for example, with the screen, we became pretty interested in how that screen not only could be used for more of a presentation like the one that we're giving right now, but it could also be used as a way to collapse space. So if you're doing a joint um, gallery opening, say with a museum in Sydney, Australia, you could begin to project the two conditions to each other. Um, we actually were playing around with the idea of, of allowing students that are walking by to be able to control what was on the screen that made a lot of the people nervous, that idea. Um, but we thought it would be an interesting way to provide an actual feedback loop and actually let the community dictate to an extent what it was that, this, that was being communicated on the screen. So we're, we're thinking about ideas like that as we're beginning to deploy things in more of a traditional and conventional way. As, as we mentioned, we, we've been collaborating on developing the, the, the sandwich um, uh, system for the overhead canopy, which we're trying to make as thin and as lightweight as possible. And it's all in tension, so it, it, it um, is a surface that connects the existing pedestrian, walk, uh, pedestrian overhead roof to that new media wall. And it's uh, held in tension along its entire length. And so we're looking at uh, different um, composites of surfaces that could filter out light and protect you from rain, but also um, allow breezes to come through and be as light and, and uh, kind of unobtrusive as possible. So we looked at the wiffle ball, for example, because of it, as, a, as a way to think about air movement. So we could begin to dampen the, the roof structure and keep it from resonating and vibrating. Um, so getting into some of the prototyping aspects of what are, what's going on, as well as then the aesthetic outcome. So milling and, and figuring out how to position and situate benches. Yeah, so as this project moves forward into the construction phase, um, one of the things that Blair and I will be uh, providing for the team is uh, full-scale prototypes of some of the unconventional elements that will make up the project. You can see these really large um, bench surfaces that students can lay on or sit on or hang out on. Um, we'll be uh, fabricating some prototypes of those benches as well as that, that kind of roof canopy, some of the planting structures, um, as well as some of the uh, custom um, uh, wall and, and structural um, elements. And we want to point out when we project. say benches, I mean, it's sort of a home -home moment potentially for, for practitioners and I think for students, but if you're in a community like this one where it's really difficult to get a toehold into the industry, something like a bench can be a really compelling thing to work on. And when we say we're going to be prototyping the bench, we're not thinking just about formal aspects of the bench. We're talking about making the Wi-Fi hotspot. We're talking about being able to control the ambient temperature of the space that you're in with your iPhone through an app. Um, we're talking about making them actually sort of responsive nodes on the surface of the bridge so that it becomes, it uses the, the technology that we have access to to make it smart, customizable, um, a more important locus than just a place to sit. So um, being able to think about these in a broad term and being able to actually sort of go American chopper on these things and pack them apart and work on them in a shop is an important thing to be able to do because we can actually get them to perform and not just speculate on what they might look like. Yeah, and the, the prototyping is a feedback loop. It goes back in and it informs the, the design of the, of the objects themselves. So this is the character of the space underneath that canopy, um, kind of a pleasant place to hang out on a nice day. And images that came before the structural analysis what that might, space might look like at night. And so the, to basically close, we use this quote quite a bit, and I'll just read it to you. If world changing has a central idea, it's this. Collaborative solution seeking is not only our best hope for solving the most profound problems facing our planet, it's the only hope. The problems we face are so huge, the momentum is so fierce, that unless we put to use the energy and creative or creativity of every person of goodwill, we can't possibly overcome them. What, what we're trying to say, one of the things that makes us, that draws us to this quote, is that we're inheriting a way of working and we basically are taught and we look at architects that often talk about sole authors. We're celebrating the author of the project. We're, saying, we're sitting up here talking to you. We recognize that our names were announced over the speakers over and over. Um, but the point that we want to carry forward is that as we move, move ahead and begin to work, I think it's really important for us to rethink not only what we're working on, but how we're beginning to assemble ourselves and organize ourselves to do work. 
And so we see the idea of social networking, the idea of being supporters of some people in a work and not being the people in front of the stage. I know Vince and Jennifer talk about this project and we're, we're basically part of the team. We're happy to be that. We talk about the idea of working against what the industry intends as its typical modes of operation or actually trying to insert ourselves into that flow upstream where we can actually impact the distribution and the shipping of a product and not just how we begin to assemble things that we inherit from other industries. Even playing around with banking models and loan models as a way to impact design. I think all these things are very much within the reach and within the, uh, I would say loosely the expertise of designers that are trained as architects, interior designers, people like that, as well as the people we team up with. If we begin to think of the design space as a whole system and not just something we do at the end to make it look a certain way, I think that we have the potential to do really good work and really important work that will have an impact uh, that's much further reaching than just the aesthetic of what it might be. I think that's a good, good place to put. So we're up here to take questions. We're told we can do a Phil Donahue thing and get into the audience if that's interesting to somebody. Thank you. Thanks.